Hello, my name is Shannon Kemp, and I'm the executor, executive, excuse me, I can't even speak in title, executive editor of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, Big Challenges in Data Modeling, State of the Union of Data Modeling, and this series is moderated by the esteemed Karen Lopez. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section, or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag BCDmodeling, Big Challenges in Data Modeling. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of this session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Joining us today are two great panelists, Sue Goins and, and Anne-Marie Smith. See, Sue, I already am hosing it there. Anne-Marie Smith, Ph.D., is an information management professional and consultant with broad experience across industries. She is a certified data management professional, CDMP, and is a frequent speaker and author on data management topics, especially data governance and enterprise data management program development. Anne-Marie is a primary author of several section of the data management body of knowledge, and she writes regular column in the data administration newsletter, tdan.com. She has a love of Sue has a love affair with data for almost 18 years now, starting with being handed a stuffy disk with a list of build, uh, builders and told, this is yours now. That love affair has led down multiple data paths, and she has worked for and with many of the largest organizations in South Africa. Sue is currently president of DEMA South, Southern Africa and the most recently elected as president of DEMA International. Things that she believes have been amazing achievements of which she is most proud include becoming the first CDMP in Africa, starting up one of the first ever data governance programs in South Africa, and being asked to appear on Karen's panel. And with that, I will turn it over to Karen to get us started. Hello and welcome. Hi, Shannon. How's your day going today? <laughs> Other than being a little tongue-tied, good. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Shannon, and thanks to Dataversity for sponsoring our monthly webinars on big challenges in data modeling. We've been putting together this year's um, sort of editorial calendar coming up. We have a whole bunch of exciting topics, but I'm always looking for input on people you'd like to hear chat about on one of our panels or events and topics you'd like to hear about. So feel free to put those in the chat or the Q&A so that we can take those forward. Um, I also want to thank my lovely panelists, Sue and Anne-Marie, and as well as all of you out there who have logged into this or maybe listening to it after the fact. I consider you our third panelist, our other panelists. So unlike other webinars and broadcasts, we heavily encourage you guys to chat with each other in the chat feature over on that sidebar on the right. Um, so please do. We try to keep an eye on that while we're multitasking and talking about these things. Um, but if you have a formal question for the group, or for Shannon, a logistics thing, please put that in the Q&A section because it's easier for us to find those and answer them for them. And final note is there are any slides. This isn't um, a lecture or a tutorial on thing. The slides we have are what you're seeing right there. So you can sit back and listen, grab your favorite beverage, whatever that is, uh, and do some chatting and interact with us. Uh, oh, I forgot to ask Shannon. Shannon, do we have polls today? Do not. I can build some, though, certainly. Okay. If you can build I did send you an email, I think. So if you can build those. Um, and if we don't get to them, that's fine, too. Uh, but let's talk about what the topic is today. So today we're going to talk about State of the Union. Well, why State of the Union? Well, because in the U.S., this is State of the Union speech time. When the talks to people about um, where they see the – where he she might see today – see the, the United States and where we're going for. And so I thought this would be a great time to have a State of the Union for data modeling. It's like a lot of, like my panelists who have a lot of experience and like a lot of you out there, um, there a, a lot of have been doing this for a long time. We've seen things that have changed over time, things that have stayed the same. Um, but I thought maybe I'd start with just a little, I'd give a brief little overview of where we've come from uh, and one of the things we're lousy at as a profession is putting together sort of a published history of, of everything that's happened. I think maybe that would be a great task for people to have. Maybe that's something we can do at the upcoming enterprise data world is get some people together, 
during one of the evenings and try to uh, collaborate and crowdsource a brief history of data modeling and data management. I think that would be great. Um, but I'll start with maybe where my career was. Is uh, I started data modeling back in the early 80s when I was in school. Um, and we have, you know, the ERDs and everything, but what we did were data flow diagrams, we created data dictionaries, we created file layouts uh, specifically um, for .NET files or vSAM files or ISAM files. And then on that same time, sort of the advent of relational databases came along, and I was, you know, very fortunate to be studying database technologies at a time when Ted Codd published his papers and vendors were beginning to build out relational features either as a layer on top of their pre-relational DBMSs or create brand new ones. And there was a lot of contention going on there about how relational are, is a relational database. So that's all an interesting time. But the data modeling I did then was probably using those green templates, mostly on green bar paper. I know I've really dated myself here, but Sue and Anne-Marie, what guys come from in data modeling? When did you get into those things? Actually, Karen, mm -hmm. I have similar experience to you. I had my data modeling career in grad school when I was introduced to modeling in a data flow diagramming format for a grad school course. And right after graduation, went to for an insurance company where w one of the people in the organization for whom I was fortunate enough to be told to work was one of Doc's She insisted that I learn relational data modeling. She's still hmm. in the profession, and she's enterprise data world as an attendee. And hers would be one of the perfect people to give you a, one of the crowdsourcing capabilities for the history of data modeling because she's been doing it since the beginning. Yeah, we um, should so make this happen. We should so make this happen, I think. I think it would be a wonderful idea. I'm sitting here Absolutely. actually waiting. Talk to Sue about Karen's idea. <laughs> Excellent. Um, that's where I started. And from there, we built one of those cruciatingly detailed, to use John Zachman's phrase, and our data models at Cigna. And we used pen and paper and some of the original case tools to build what was completely normalized, oh my god, normal form model, with conceptual data model and all the metadata associated with it. That's how long ago it was, back in yeah. the 1980s. A uh, lot of things to do right and a lot of things I would never do again. <laughs> and yeah, I keep muting myself because the planes are still coming over. So I think <laughs> then I'm the real, I'm the real baby here because it will be, <laughs> Since February 1996, probably at about 9 a.m. in the morning, that my new boss handed me the stiffy disk and said, here, you need to look after these people. This is your problem. So I subsequently put the stiffy disk in the PC that was on the desk, and I looked at it, and I went back to him, and I said, this needs a database. He says, well, go buy one. Here's my credit card. So that is how I started, and I really did. I went out there, and the only database I knew of was Access. So I brought it back to the office, installed it, copied all of these things out of this Lotus 1, 2, 3, and pasted it into Access. Oh, that's how much I knew what I was doing. So about two weeks, I guess, of like really typing in pieces of information every time I got a new builder, and it suddenly occurred to me that I was being a bit silly. And then I started looking at the data and going, but that looks like that, and that looks like that. And uh, I think by the end of the year, I had six developers working for me, and we'd moved from Access into SQL Server 6.5. So that's how I started data modeling. It was no training, nothing. I just didn't have a choice because I couldn't live with typing in about 100 columns across an access table. 
And I think, you know, that is the most common way. When I do my presentations at EDBO, I usually ask people, how did you get started in all this and, and those things? And the, I mean, 80 to 90% of people in the room got either the term, I fell into data modeling, which I always think is hilarious, or they were pushed into it. Um, and, and, you know, they, had to, they were finding a better way. Today, I'm not sure that's how that happens, and that's what we're going to talk about in just a little bit. Um, I mentioned that I started with green templates and green bar paper, and and we did have um, a, a model tool, Accelerator, which I think was primarily yes. a data flow diagramming tool, um, and it was all seen as new, 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 right? Because we had at that time we still would have had DOS-based machines. Gosh, I feel like I'm telling people how I walked up hill both ways in the snow to school every day. But then on my career, just as I was getting that, um, you know, the, the modeling tools, the case tools were coming out. There was IEF and IEW, which became ADW. And there were things like Bachman, data modeling tools, and Irwin and S-Designer, which became, I think, Power Designer. And then there were Silver Run and Oracle tools. What have I left out here that people worked with? Back then, uh, case wise, and it's the enterprise oh. architect that doesn't enterprise just stuff itself. Enterprise architect, Hopkins, yeah. and system architect, system architect, and, and yes, of course, ER Studio now. Yes, I mean, so um, the newer tools that came out, like the the Oracle Designer, ER Studio. Oh, yeah. um, remember when? Uh, Irwin uh, came out with just a little nobody tool, and then e Studio came out. Or Ace, also another one. The Oracle uh, Irwin was built in New Jersey, not far from where I live. Yes, I remember that. Um, and also at the same time, when these tools came out, then the big question became, what notation should they use? Oh, so yes. there was notation. And then uh, the United States government, mostly the Air Force, got together and, and came up with IDEF 1X and all the IDEF zeros and all the other notations. And about the same time, we had what is sometimes called Martin notation, sometimes called information engineering notation. But basically, there's that and the crow feet and all of those things. Also interesting, at the same time, when relational things were coming out, so the organizations that eventually became DEMA came. Um, I think DEMA recently celebrated a birthday. Was it 40 years, you guys? I can't remember. Yes, 40 Where years. Uh, 40 years as an organization. Yeah, uh, chapters. I think, and, and the then my own, yeah. my own chapter, ERMAC, is even older than that. So I think we're 45 plus years. So going on all those things, and then. We kind of fast forward in just a few years ago, DEMA came out with the data management, the guide to the data management body of knowledge, and also worked with ICCP to come up with the certification. And I think that's kind of covered sort of the tools, the approaches, the notations, um, all those things. Anything major that I left out? Frustration factor, I think. The frustration factor. Um, so that's also a whole other webinar that I, I love. It's my favorite topic. Um, one of those things about sort of the conflicting points of view and how we reward people differently to be architects and designers versus builders. Um, a whole other topic. It's still one of my favorite ones, though. But yes, the frustration of figuring out where formal data modeling methods fit within other methods and tools. So I think that's a good segue to where we are. Else, uh, so, uh, uh, and method one. I remember, oh, the methodologies. I so should have mentioned yeah. that because I worked for big methodology companies as well. So that was the other thing that came along with the case tools was the methodology wars. Um, it got to the point where one of the methodologies I was asked to implement for a client had something like 400 deliverables for each pro formal deliverables. It was, um, and and so there was that whole. A lot of them were tagged as, as information engineering methodologies. Talk about that because most of us have tried to ban the word methodology because it got so much hype, and so much uh, be burnt by to follow a methodology without following their brains. So all of that stuff. 
where we are now. So out of all those tools I mentioned, um, a, a lot of them still exist somewhere in some form. I know that Silver Run was put into open source at White. I know that um, Power Designer is still going strong, Irwin ER Studio. I know technically, I think I have and ADW still exists somewhere in the CA world of tools. Um, Oracle has a SQL developer tool, but Oracle Designer is no longer supported. Um, so there's lots of the current tools. Um, Visio, I forgot to mention Visio as probably the second most popular data model tool right after the number one data modeling tool, which tends to be either Excel or PowerPoint. So that's which is a frightening thing to hear. Yeah. yeah. And and I do I have a blog post about that. I'll try to look that up and share that in the comments. It'll definitely go out into the uh post notes about what makes for a good data modeling tool. Um oh, and the other thing I missed in all this is that the sort of the advent of repository model marts collaboration mm -hmm. modeling. To me that was a big change in the modeling world where we came yeah. from. Um, so, where now, though, is that what I hear from the field is that, you know, one of the biggest frustrations, one of the big challenges that people have is trying to make this formal data modeling methods work within the constantly changing workflow and methods that are happening in the software engineering world. So, of course, the number one player there is Agile, Scrum, some of the other newer things, plus um, you know, uh, very specific things like code first and all of those, and I've talked about those on other webinars too. Uh, where are do you, I'll ask Sue this. Sue, where do you think we are now with our way of thinking about how we develop models fit within these new and the changing role of software engineering methods? I sometimes feel like I've done a whole 360. Um, you know, originally I really did. It was extremely agile. I kind of stuck stuff together, made sense of it, spoke to the developers, and got them to understand what I was doing, and we went ahead. I don't think I even understood the, the, the methodology of build your conceptual one, then go to your logical, then do this, and then do that. So I learned that post having done the whole agile mechanism. And I, I do feel that sometimes we've gone all the way back to the beginning. I have to say I'm not quite sure that I agree with it because I now sit at the end of having done a bit of agile data modeling with some of the developers. And today I spent the whole day trying to make sense of millions and millions of rows of data that I feel that I made a mistake on because I designed the data model. But I did it agilely because I had to do it quickly and I didn't take into account uh, things like how many records there would be, the fact that the developers would go behind my back and make changes that I didn't know about. You've, you've met those guys, have you? <laughs> and, what's what's um, different about all the other architects on our projects? Do they suffer from the same thing? What different I have about heard us? so. <laughs> I don't know, you know what, I mean, I see that there's a gentleman here, gee, he's from the, the, the South Africa as well, and I actually uh, met him and spent some time chatting to him, and um, I have had him say very similar things to me as well, that it, it, we, we seem to all suffer from the same problem, but we don't quite know how to resolve it. So one of the things is, like, the architects I work with are either enterprise architects, which means they're responsible for a whole bunch of models sometimes done in enterprise architecture tools, um, and they usually have more clout or authority, and sometimes data architects report up through them because data architecture is a subset of the enterprise architecture. Um, they sometimes suffer from this whole uh, um, sort of uh, impedance match of, of what an architect and what developers and technicians want to put into place. Uh, but I'm wondering, they're just, maybe because I'm doing the data architecture as well, that I, I feel like there's much more resistance from teams that are quite fair to be fair to them, compensated and measured to do things that break our architecture. 
measure them on performance and getting things done fast, and we don't measure them on data quality, data integrity, or flexibility for far future versions, usages of the data. Um, different about us is that, that suffering so much from this. Is it us? Should we be looking at ourselves? Or is it a combination of those things, Anne-Marie? I, I think it's a combination of those things, Karen. Mm -hmm. I said that one of the things I've seen in the assessments I do for enterprise data management, and I include, if I can, the development of an enterprise data architecture group in that and organizations is that most organizations don't invite the enterprise architecture team to include the architecture pro properly. They do send their technical techs, their infrastructure architects, et cetera, to do that will break a data architecture. They, they don't view the impossibility rules, the use of data governance, the organization of master and reference data into an architectural approach. They want them to do things fast. Mm -hmm. Have an enterprise data management strategy that looks at data as a corporate asset and a provide business value. You have to take perspective on enterprise architecture enterprise data management strategy yep. to be effective, and for your enterprise architecture, I think I'll have to chan Shannon's, I can't even smell at all. <laughs> You're doing great. Tongue twisted. Uh, um, I think you have a challenge on both areas, and every station is different, but I see this continually, to where I'm sounding like I'm on a little soapbox, because I see it all the time. Right. So not only that, but I can tell you, I've either been on panels or attended panels for the last, well, let's say 25 years, and we're still having the same discussion. Yes. Um, yes. So, so I know it's going to be a little bit disruptive, but we've got our polls. So I want to go ahead and do the poll really quickly. So um, first I ask is, uh, who are you guys, you participants? Can people see the polls? They should. Oh, yep. People voting. And I'm just paying attention. I'm going to give about 10 more seconds. Get voting. I know we have more people than this. Actually, and often. Just in Florida. Have to. Next poll is closing in 15 seconds. Keep voting. Excellent. So, I would say it's me with me. It's good though. Okay. So, and people see the results? I can never tell. I forgot to learn as an attendee this time. Um, I see the results. Yeah. So basically, so basically, we have about 50% data modelers, architects, 8% business analysts, other analysts, 4% DBAs, devs, other techs, 3% architects, 5% other, and 10% of you who have no idea what you are or are busy find someone on Twitter. So then we'll go to the next one. How long have you been actively data modeling? Now, by actively data modeling, it means either they're creating or consuming or working with models. And I'm going to assume that if you're here, you're actively working with it, even if you're learning them. So we'll go ahead and open that poll. I keep thinking there should be Jeopardy music here. Bum, Some bum, sort of weight bum, music. Bum, bum, exactly. Why the feeling that E is going to be the big one? <laughs> yeah. That's right. On slides, on my bio slides, 
as I always say, I've been doing this for 20 plus years because I've mostly stopped counting. <laughs> My boss says the same thing, 20 plus years. Yeah, I can go back to saying 10 plus, I think. It's like the experience I get, the more I have to skew the data results. <laughs> okay, I'm still waiting, so when I get 20 years, can I also do the same thing? Absolutely. Or, yeah, I also so, Yeah. Again, very common, right? So, um, yeah. So let's see. Yeah, this is, this is interesting. So we have, you know, a dozen people or so that have been doing data modeling for zero to two years, and it's about the same amount doing three to five years, and 13% doing six to ten. And, uh, that makes it sound like we're doing prison terms, doesn't it? 22% <laughs> of you are doing 10 to 15 years, and almost 30% saying, I stopped counting. Um, so, yeah. So this is both a plus and minus, I think, sometimes on my project team. So because I'm so experienced, a lot of people on my team assume that I'm really stuck in the old ways, because most of us, uh, that, um, or that my projects, I'm coming in to help fix a data model and a database design. And so other people there, their, their experience with data modeling is very light um, and you know, very light as far as depth and breadth of their experience. Okay, so now we can go back to some of our questions. So where we are now. So the other thing I wanted to talk about in the State of the Union, where I see things, is well, I've I deemed 2013 as the year of data, and now I'm going to still call 2014 the year of data because data is just so prevalent in the news with big data, with um, big sites not being happy, with data integration projects making world news, um, with uh, ditches being a big deal. I know I was impacted by the U.S. one last week, and it's been very annoying um, as I release all my credit cards. Um, but right now, I think with the uh, biggest question now to my panelists, um, let's go back to Sue. Sue, most of the modeling tools these days work either with IE notation or IDEF 1X notation. Um, the, it, it, Notations, they really haven't been updated in a long time. Are they still meeting our needs? So not the tools, but the notations we're using, like ERD, like IE, Guide F1X. What do you think? I'm actually sure that they are. Um, I think they have been, but I think there's this, there's this real change to Agile and this real change of, of the way we think about data. And, and I, I really believe that we might need to revisit these notations and actually take a, a good, strong look at them and say, okay, does this really work? Is it giving us what we want? Is it actually meeting our needs? And I'm, I'm, I would probably bet on it. I, I would probably actually put some meat on it, but it's actually not the case and that um, we should be really revisiting this kind of thing. Yeah. Do you have any you know, examples I mean, of things you'd like to see it notation support that they don't support right now? I know I'm on the spot here. I, I know. Um, I think for me it's about understanding the relationships between data and the context of data. So you have this little uh, notion where we've got three lines pointing that way and one line pointing the other way and and all of these things. And traditional data modelers, uh, and there are a lot of them around, they understand that, they get it immediately. But what I do see is a lot of lot day is that there aren't so many traditional data modelers as there are people who are, um, as you said earlier, falling into it and are doing it because there's nobody else around to do it and they've got a bit of a passion um, for getting the data right and they have absolutely no idea what they're doing and they go and look at a book and it then goes, hmm, so what's a crow's feet notation? And unfortunately, unless you've seen Alex's um, little dance about crow's feet, um, <laughs> You always really know. So I'd like to see, if I say I'd like to see it in a more English language way, I think where it's more visual, um, <laughs> more visual than the crow's feet or, or more, more visual than the other things. <laughs> you know, again, I'm sort of, you're right, yeah. you did put me on the spot. That's mean. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's good. <laughs> but, yeah. And I think, 
I see a comment oh. there from Ben talking about we, we, the, the, this is um, as an above 40 crowd. Um, yeah. And I think that's also very true because what it means is we are all more traditional. The younger generation who are coming into data modeling are kind of challenging the, 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 the tried and trusted, and some of their challenges are actually valid. Think about our notations. I know the notations necessarily are lacking. I think it's the understanding of how to use them to address what the mar and the user and the developer want to represent that's lacking. Hmm. Right? I think. From my perspective, the probably adequate in anything experience to this point that says I do what I needed to do with the notes. However, I've seen time and again and where less experienced modeler or who didn't understand what an expense modeler was trying to convey makes the best use of the capabilities in the model. So we were ending up going from Philadelphia yeah. to Phoenix to Dallas and then finally to Austin. <laughs> yeah, I think there, that's always going to be an issue. Um, I've opened up a poll on this thing um, in, about the audience feels about this, uh, and I, I think that the most common one we use right now is actually a com at least in the major tools is a combination of uh, some IE stuff. So IDEF one X didn't have the crow's feet normally. Uh, mm -hmm. That was an IE notation or a Martin notation, um, but one X was the one that had all the attributes look like a table. It looked like a reverse engineered table and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I think though that standard and a lot of modeling tool vendors, you definitely want to meet standards that you can get government contracts when the governments have that as a standard or organizations do. But that actually, as far as I know, isn't actively maintained anymore. If there's a, an active, you know, group of people buying it, and I'm finding there are features that I want to see in the notation. So things like the most common one with IDEF one X is it doesn't support ARCs, which means, you know, a mutually exclusive relationship. Like this entity is related to only one of these other entities at the same time. And IDEF X one X has another way of doing that with subtyping, but that that's not really successful way of conveying that information. And I know there are people who've been doing a lot of work to try to um, try to share or, or to come up with notations. I know even Harry Ellis, who was responsible for architecting a lot of the original Barker notation, and, and people have worked on extending things, and there are some new notations that are sometimes put around. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, we can only profession that had this sort of way of conveying data about our data hasn't changed in 25 years, that there aren't new ways of thinking about how we want to explain data and the underlying metadata for them. So with this, it works, but I'd like us to see us mutation. So one of the questions in the, in the forum is, what about UML? So you have the, uh, the modeling approach methodology and notation, and I, fortunately I've had a great deal of success convenient with, with business users. I have better success with UML notations with more technical people. It was originally designed for technical people. I know David Hayes done a lot, a lot of work of making UML notation work with uh, you know, how to make uh, diagrams work better in the business side, um, but I think it has solved any of the problems that I have of of wanting to, to have a single notation that meets both audiences, and maybe that's the issue. I'm not sure. Any other comment panelists about that? 
Carrie, I'm seeing in amongst the uh, chats going on here is that it seems that most people use a bit of a combination of bits and pieces to, to get their points across. But what yeah. I did see is one comment I thought was pretty good. Um, what, sorry, I'm just looking back up at there. From Tom, okay, I think that's Bill C, something yep. like that. Yep. Yep. Um, he's talking about... Um, is a data model is a picture of data, and we create them to talk better to our clients, both business and IT. The wood has definitely advanced us to a more graphic level of expectations. Um, oops, lost this now. Uh, would <laughs> we see more use and acceptance by the business if we made the model more graphical and Photoshop-like? And I think that was probably something I was trying to get at, is that yeah. I really would like to see more... Um, visualization of the data rather than the old sort of like here's a table, here's a line going here, here's a line going there. And you're right, it does miss some of the mutually exclusive relationships or the this thing can be related to this and this, but it can't be related to that. And even yeah. if you relate it to that and that, but by the third one, it's, it shouldn't be related. Right. Another common um, request that I see and also that I've talked with Harry about is that this their concept of one to many, but sometimes the manyness is just over time, right? So, you know, I think commonality and optionality and the relationships and the constraints that they end up generating are, are where our, our current notations are. are I want to be able to say, you know, that, uh, you know, I had at least one order to be a customer in my business. Um, but over time, they could submit me, but there's only ever one active one. I mean, right now in data modeling, where do you put those more complex biz rules? You either, you know, have to just document them as uh, in text. I, I'd like to be able to put that right into the model. So I want more um, ability to support and capture as a text field, not as a drawing thing. I want to capture more stuff that are fully understood by the tool. And I know they all, we, our tools have user different properties and attachments and different ways of extending the models. I get that. But I want them to come up with a standard. I want the profession to come up with a standard um, in theory so that all tools could support this and so that we could have a, a standard way of portraying that information. So am I doing a good job? I want, we, we've, we've kind of stopped building and improving our notations, and I see that as an issue. And I also think that the sort of uh, making things more visual and, and having more flexibility with visualizations is important. Um, and, and I know a lot of vendors doing a lot of work on that, and I know that's a hard thing to do, and I just want to keep seeing progress on that. We're at 2.40. I wanted to move on to, um, I want to remind everybody at, at the attendees that you can ask formal questions in the Q&A. I've been trying to answer most of those. Um, I am trying to keep track of that, but you guys are doing a great job on chat. That's so much that I can barely keep track of it. But where we want to be now, so my biggest thing over the last couple of years, and it's come up on several of these webinars, so I don't want to rehash all that, that stuff, is where is it to be this year in 2014 year of data when we've got all these non-relational data things to model? Meaning or NoSQL or big data, whatever you want to call those, those things. What are in the data modeling world to support that? Anne-Marie? I <laughs> now that's a great question for a panelist to answer. With, with this comment, I wonder. Because I see this area as a of possibilities and fraught with turmoil. Um, we have several camps right now. We have the NoSQL camp that says, you need to build anything, just do it. There are so many different definitions of what, quote, NoSQL means. SQL community, if you read different ratings by 
do you read writings by different members of the NoSQL thought leader community? You'll get different versions of what the community means. So I'm sure that data modeling could, could should be right now with the NoSQL community. From a child perspective, you already given several comments on how data modeling could help. Shall we put some process around some of the more carry ways agile behaves? I'd love to see um, for a take to the data part in an our world, and I think data modeling done properly without spending 17 years contemplating the different parts of a data model in an agile world, um, I think really find a lot of use for data modeling in an agile development. If you could work with the agile community to do that, not you, we. Um, but I think there, I think all the areas are, are filled opportunity, and I think it's a great way for DEMA, smooth plug for DEMA, <laughs> to get in the forefront of being a thought leader in the data community by lead efforts to discuss these things. Yep. So, <laughs> do I have a choice? Yeah. No, I do agree do. with you. I absolutely do agree with you, and I think that this is a this is a task that that DEMA should drive. I mean, we have chapters all over the world, and we have some really great, some really eager, some really passionate people. And I think as DEMA International, we should really be driving, getting people together, even in you know these kind of environments, just to talk about it and and to start identifying what are the things we should change, what are the things that are really good and still working. And one of the things that are just so busted that, that they're never going to work. I mean, um, I see Frida has a, has a comment here about how are you depicting big data? She says blobs of unformatted data in our tools. You know, and, and there really is. I mean, how are we depicting big data? And I think a lot of us are kind of just of putting a, a little circle there or a little square, square there and going, okay, well, that's big data. Um, again, do we have a handle on it? Do we know the context of it? Do we know the context of our data? Because that, for me, is always very important in data modeling. So there's a, I really feel that this is a good topic for the international to take on as a um, challenge. And I think, yeah. Karen, you might be a good leader in that. <laughs> You're always volunteering people. So I one know, of the that's like, what makes me a president. <laughs> I know, I'm very presidential. So one of the things about all of this is that I think one of the things happening in the data modeling community and our big challenge is that um, we're so over uh, tasked and understaffed. Um, it keeps us from even having the time to go learn. I mean, my to-do list, my to-learn to, -do, to -learn list about all the other technologies so I can help try to figure out where is data modeling going to fit on this. I know on one of the webinars I had last year on this whole modeling with NoSQL and big data, we have another one coming up this year as well, is, you know, everyone agreed, and it wasn't just data modelers on my panel, that there's some data modeling that needs to happen. It just needs to happen in a different way, maybe a different time. And it might not be the same data modeling that we use now. It's just who's going to solve that problem. It, it needs to be the data management profession participating in that and the right type of people, the people who aren't, you know, anti doing something differently is to come there. There's a real problem. On the projects I'm on, there's a real problem that we have this big, big divide between traditional 1980s data modelers and the people who are trying to get stuff done and solving new problems. And there's this whole sort of thing going on in our, our, our profession about big data is just a fad and it's just something, it's nothing new, it's just the mainframe. Well, if it was just the mainframe, frame, we'd be pointing our data modeling tools at it and doing it that way. It is different. Um, and another webinar, I think other big pain points and challenges with data modeling right now is all the new 
of things I need to model. I'm not just modeling databases. We're not just building new databases all the time. You know, most of my clients, it's all packages. And the modeling we're doing is this canonical model in the middle, or modeling the packages that don't have a documented model, trying to sort of reverse engineer and reverse guess a logical data model and maybe a conceptual data model, then building something so that we can interface the data either through services or through direct integration or integration packages, or interface service buses and all of those things. Uh, but the other things that are coming are support cloud databases because they're not quite the same as traditional relational databases, even the, the relational databases in the cloud like SQL Azure and all of those, they're slightly different. And some of my tools support that and some don't. Um, where should, where do you guys think that the modern tool space, the vendors, are they prepared for dealing with these new things? Panel Yeah, I think I think maybe some of them, Anne Marie, what do you think? A couple of them? Most of them not. I think I most of them agree. are still I think they're still trying to fix the current ones. Never mind um <laughs> go to the new stuff where where we're saying, Listen, we need to model our data in a different way. We we need to um not be necessarily so um inflexible and insist that it's done this way or we need to do some more graphical stuff so that when we show it to a user who has no idea what a database looks like, he or she doesn't run away screaming because there's that little square blocks with lines again. So, um, yeah, I don't think everyone's ready for it. I do, however, think that there's one or two organizations, vendors out there who are Getting really close towards this cutting edge of let's try and do something different and satisfy the, the challenges that we have. Yeah. You say which ones? <laughs> oh, okay. I would be concerned that we don't have more than one or two vendors who are that far sighted. I think most of them are still stuck in the several releases behind yeah. very proprietary if I don't that proprietary might not be the right word, but very protective that might be the better word approach to my or the highway and no you can't share data from one to another unless you let us do it for you and you have to buy everything our way. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. Um, and I, I use, uh, I don't have one specific tool I use and say, okay, this is the tool of my choice. I will always use that one or everything else. So I've tried quite a lot of them and sometimes I go, I wish that they would all just be one, then maybe all the nice things I like in in A and the nice things I like in B could all go into the C and then I'd get what I want a little bit more. So, you know, I think part of it is they're all trying to, to be, hey, listen, use my tool because it's the best, but they're probably not taking into account the people at the end who have to use it, which is us. And um, I think I really wish that maybe the vendors would sit together and go, you know what, maybe we should just do one and we'll make it the best we can do, rather than let's all have one and try and sell it, but it's not really going to work for what you really and truly want. I think there's all of that. Um it's kind of mentioned on tools and price. Um, so one of the issues that's that's holding a lot of my teams back, um, working in these new base worlds where almost everything is free and open source, so Hadoop and, and all of these other, you know, they all have free versions of their DBMSs, is they're in a position where they're going to be paying, you know, 10K a seat for modeling tool. Um, so one of the things that's kind of happened is our tools got better and more mature, and they do all these amazing things, and they have these great features. The total cost of ownership for them has gone up because they 
support so many things, because they support enterprise modeling, because they have a full-blown repository with versioning control and everything like that, that, that the children are used to using free software or open source software, both for their development needs and for the implementation needs, you know, it's harder for them to understand why one might pay for enterprise design and development software. And there aren't, while there are some open source modeling tools out there, they definitely don't have the maturity that we've seen of 20 plus years of release cycles for our modeling tools. Um, would you agree with that? agree with it. <laughs> and so, why I say that conditionally is because I said that challenge and also have the challenge of the because do that then why should I buy anything? So that's it. And why they want drawing tools. Because drawings are relatively cheap or embedded in other tool suites. Yeah. Yeah. I think another yeah, I, I think another um, issue that I probably face here is that the um, organizations that I traditionally sort of sit, tend to be supporting are generally the larger organizations, and they don't do the let's buy open source or let's use open source. Um, they're far more the let's throw lots of money at something because it can only work if we throw lots of money at it. Oh, so, I like that. Uh, yeah, but <laughs> doesn't throw money my way. <laughs> 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 so, so what I see, what I see happening is that the, the big organisations will uh, get some new VP of this or or, or chief, chief um, da 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 officer of that, and they come along and they say, no, we're going to do this and we're going to make our data really great, and to do that I need this tool and that tool and that software, and they go along and they spend a huge amount of money and they get going for all of eighteen months and then. Suddenly Suddenly, oh, their tenure is up, they're going somewhere else. So that whole stuff just gets shelved in the corner. The next guy comes along and does exactly the same, but he doesn't want those tools because those tools were, oh, previous dude's um, stuff, and I need yeah. new stuff because mine is better. So okay. in the organizations that I do seem to support, um, there's or seven different data modeling tools. There are six or seven different uh, MDM tools. There are six or seven different data quality tools. And you name it, there's a tool for everything out there, and the big organizations have them all. They don't talk to each other, and then we fall down on um, the data models anyway. So uh, it's a case of, okay, we can't read an Irwin model in that product. We can't read a Power Designer yeah. one in that product. Therefore, we have to redo it. And since we didn't really know what we were doing in the first place, and the people who did design <laughs> that are long gone, um, ouch. <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah, there's, there's, again, the same frustrations. So get down to the last few minutes. I have another poll for everybody. And this one is, so we've got a, um, uh, our, I think our March webinar is going to be about data modeling, dead or alive. It's kind of a an update to our last year's Is Data Modeling Dead webinar. Um, the questions I'm trying to use to gauge about sort of the life of data modeling out there is any sort of full-time equivalents of data modelers. And I don't care whether you're an employee or a contractor or a consultant. In your organization, are you seeing more, more full-time equivalents? Of data and people whose primary responsibility is data modeling and data architecture, are you seeing more of them or fewer of them in your shops? And um, I'd like to get a lot of people voting on this so that I can see how it's going. So even if you've pitched away and you are busy playing Candy Crush or something on Facebook, if you could pop over and vote in this poll and look, it's already starting to close. Get you in. You got four. Click, 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 click. Okay. And what we're seeing is that, wow, that's not quite the great guy. Not very many people voted, 
but it looks kind of evenly spread that we have more. 13% of you have more, 10% have about the same, 10% have fewer, and an alarming 13% don't really have full-time data modelers at all. Um, I think that I'm getting lots of reports from the field that there are fewer and fewer data modelers in organizations. What are you guys seeing? Fewer, definitely. Ever data modeling responsibilities given to other team members in the organization. What I call accidental data modeling. Data yes. Well, uh, the, the the contract that I'm busy working on right now, uh, there is one data modeler, um, the whole organization, um, yep. and that's me. Yeah, I see quite a bit. I, I see that quite and, a bit. And what's really scary is that I actually am not factored in to do any kind of works. data modeling. Yeah. A very specific thing that I'm supposed to be doing um, and it actually bears no relation to please build me a data model um, or please can you tell me why this table doesn't look like it should and, and, and what I should be looking at. And I'd say probably at the moment almost 30 to 40 percent of my time is doing answering those kind of questions or even if it comes to a piece of paper and quickly drawing a model. And I'm the only person in the whole organization and I'm talking over 6,000 people. Yeah. 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 Um, one of the comments in the Q&A is there's a shortage of them to find our company wants them. I have also experienced this trying to help clients hire what I consider real professional data modelers or data architects. Like people, not just people who have once reverse engineered a database or once took a class seven years ago, people who have several years of experience of doing that. Um, and I think that's a real problem for data. I think it's a real problem. Like, I want people to love their data, and I want there to be professional data managers, right? Um, and the thing is, is that when we go to, to events, you know, everyone looks very experienced. When we go to EDW, I see very experienced people. I ask people how long they've been data modeling. It's cues into the double digits. So we've got a real problem here. And we're getting close to the end of our time, but I'm hoping we can continue this discussion. We always invite people to stay over for about 15 more minutes with the recording turned off where we can talk about some of the things. So um, because we have two minutes, I think I'll start the wrap up. Um, I want to thank um, my lovely panelists, Sue and Anne-Marie. And I always think when we get to the end of these, we should just have more time for this. Uh, this is why we started doing the pre and after show. I want to thank Shannon for making all this stuff happening and making all the magic happen and and make sure we all get here and get logged in and the attendees get their support. I want Dataversity for hosting these. And I I want to remind you that we, we these happen every month. So the fourth Thursday, is it the fourth? <laughs> They happen every month. You can go to dataversity.net. The other thing is I want to put a plug in for Enterprise Data World. You guys are both coming to Enterprise Data World, right? We're right. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yes, definitely. And it's going to be a lot of fun. And it's, it's, it's 18th year. I go to it every year. I think I've only missed a couple of years during due to track constraints. Um, and in part, uh, it's great learning from very good thought leaders, and you can go to dataversity.net to see, as well as it's um, a good sort of uh, sort of way of, of getting sort of your show back for data modeling by having these same discussions with other people and sharing useful tips. I'll be speaking there as well. I'm doing a workshop and I'm running a SIG. So those are all the things we're going to do. So, Shin, I'm going to turn this back over to you. And Karen and Sue and Anne Marie, thank you so much for this fantastic discussion. It's just I, I just love these webinars and as especially love all the attendees who just chat away and really get involved in the discussion. It's just the, I think what makes this webinar specifically. I'm still just tongue tied today. <laughs> uh, um, so anyway, I hope everyone has a great day. I will turn off the recording. We'll get the post show started. And thank you everybody for your time.